Greetings and welcome. My name is Frank Murdoch. I'm the host of today's ASQ Laner Enterprise Division webinar. With me is Hank Zarnicki. He's also part of our webinar team, and Hank is going to be handling uh, the Q&A for this session. We hold these webinars once each month, and they are free to all our members. Our webinars are recorded, so previous webinars are available on the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division YouTube channel. Eric Budd is presenting today's topic, which is part two of Rapid Improvement Cycles and Deming System of Profound Knowledge. Heidi Nielsen, who co-authored this presentation, is not able to be with us today. Heidi is an operational leader in pharmaceutical and biotechnology manufacturing and contract research services. She is a graduate of the IQI Academy and has dedicated her career to process development and leading change in highly regulated environments. Eric, who's gonna be our speaker, is an improvement leader who successfully employs lean methods to generate improvements in both manufacturing and non-manufacturing processes based on the work of Dr. W. Evers Deming. Got some logistics I'd like to cover. Everyone will be on mute, but you are free to post questions to Eric as you think of them. This shows a, um, the screen and the panel that shows you how you can post those questions as you think of them. There's also a handout available, and I'm showing you, again, the uh, control panel and where you can download that handout of uh, the material that Eric is going to be presenting. About a day after this webinar, you should, as a registered attendee, receive a certificate of attendance. Now, you get an email from host ASQRD, and in that email, if you look at the bottom, the area there is your certificate is available here. There's a button there. Push that button, and you'll be able to view and and uh, save your certificate. We also have, as I say, monthly webinars. Our next webinar is going to be November 13th. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Eric Budd. Eric, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Frank. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for part two of our description of our minimal viable product as we looked at how do we coach a coach who is leading a team leader of an improvement team. It seems convoluted, but it's a, a worthwhile effort uh, we're finding. Um, we're going to discuss the next phases of the learning we've gone through since we last presented. Um, we've added a few concepts and ideas along the way, and uh, we're excited to share those uh, with you. Now, this continues to be a work in progress, and uh, perhaps uh, somewhere down the road, uh, we'll stop back again and talk about how we're progressing with our, our approach. Um, we will be covering uh, areas that connect to or describe how Dr. Deming's system of profound knowledge, theory of knowledge, appreciation for a system, and understanding variation apply. We discussed psychology in the previous webinar. We'll also talk about some observations we've made while we're coaching the coach, coaching the team leader, and some common issues that show up as we deal with leaders, leadership, and teams as they go through their improvement activities. So one of the things we ask ourselves is, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, here's, here's generally what we're looking at. Um, we're, we're trying to get teams that can 
uh, operate in a way that minimizes the time required to determine a useful focus for their improvement work. Um, what is their aim? What are they trying to get done? And then to focus those improvement efforts quickly while maximizing the impact of their change efforts. And then from each test, we want to maximize the learning, whether those tests produce dead ends, near misses, or successes. And then finally, we want to engage all team members in the work. Now, what we notice is that um, there are opportunities that present themselves to us. And frequently, uh, the opportunities that we're talking about include times when we need a team to address process or quality issues. Now, Edison had it right. There's an abundance of opportunities facing us. Uh, he suggests we might be able to create our own good fortune if we're prepared in the face of those opportunities. Stephen Covey talked about the law of the harvest and contrasted it with cramming the night before a test. Improvement work appears to follow principles like those on a farm. There are no, short, no shortcuts for us, and we see that we reap what we sow as far as our preparation goes. And as Stephen Covey says, there really is no shortcut in getting ready for the work of improvement. So now we can um, ask ourselves, hey, now that we've returned from practice or from improvement training camp, um, uh, but wait, maybe we, we haven't been to training camp? So how many leaders are actually practiced in the cycles of action required to address problems and produce improvement? Let's, let's think about this from a perspective, from an example in the world of sports. NFL coaches typically have about 1,000 plays in their playbook. Personnel changes impact what plays they, they can actually run. Practice is used to determine what plays can be run as well as for learning plays. Coaches meet after practice daily to evaluate the pros and cons of every play they can imagine using in a game situation. The playbook for the season is an accumulation of the plays that they've selected, and the playbook selection need to be taught some of the plays are from the previous season, and minimal roster turnover is a benefit. All plays will be installed during the 55 or so training camp practices. During the season, it's too late to dramatically change what the team can do. Prior to game day, the opponent is known. Play options are reduced to a, by, by about half. For example, when working against an opponent running a 4-3 defense, the available roster will determine which of the remaining plays can be run. Maybe about 100 are now feasible, but practice time is limited, and eventually about 40 plays become the core of the game plan. The quarterback or team lead on the field provides input on which plays he feels confident in the team's running, which then cuts the number to about 30 to 35. Then the play call sheet is developed to list the plays that can be used in each game situation. First downs, second downs, second downs between five and seven yards, and so on. If a coach has not seen an opponent do something in the last four games, he's probably not going to practice against it. In practice, the coach focuses on the plays and thus the players you will most likely use in the upcoming game. In the end, it's not what the coach knows that matters. It's what the players know. Marty Schottenheimer said, used to say, when you're in trouble, think players, not plays. So when we think of our players and our plays, we think of our improvement team, our improvement team leader, and then we think what percentage of their working time is devoted actually to the work of improvement. Another example from the the sports world and in the NFL on a game day only about 11 minutes of the entire broadcast is actually playing time the rest is something that we might all consider as waste 
So when we talk about what are we trying to accomplish, we're thinking in terms of, well, one of the things we're trying to accomplish is preparing our teams and team leaders. Last time we talked a little bit about the three basic questions, we introduced the plan, do, study, act cycle and discussed psychology. And we realized during our MVP work that a key phase of the work is preparation, getting teams and team leaders ready. So one of the, the ways to do this is have some on the court practice. And when people participate in the IQI Academy, they get that practice. They create projects, they have a list of projects they actually generate, and they down select using criteria that lets them choose a project that will work during the three month period that they participate in the academy. They determine and set scope. In fact, most teams realize that scope setting is one of the biggest challenges they run into. Oftentimes people are out to um, save the planet when they first start and then they realize maybe the best I can do is uh, change the arrangement of the work area and uh, make a difference there. Yeah. So they begin to select methods to evaluate success or completion. They plan tests that are aimed at improvement to ensure learning, not just running a variety of experiments, but they also include methods that allow them to make sure that they're getting more knowledgeable about their work, their processes, and the people in their systems. They learn to evaluate results and then they choose next steps. Now, what we find is the practice field is rarely a concept that's applied in our organizations today, and yet it's pretty critical that we have an opportunity to practice. Now, one of the things we ended up developing during our work is something called the capacity matrix, which is really turned into a tool for uh, self-directed learning. It has several areas in it, um, ours, you know, it's, it's a concept that we learned from David Langford during one of his education seminars. It applies nicely to the work we're doing. Um, we include areas of quality, system, variation, theory of knowledge, psychology, PDSA, team, and team leader. So except for the team leader area, all participants on an improvement team have an opportunity to go through this matrix and evaluate themselves. Now, we have, um, here, let me zoom in a little bit on one of these. As we look at this, each person has an opportunity to say, I can describe this, I can use, apply, or perform that this thing, or I can teach it. And as people walk through the matrix, they can list, here's the evidence, that uh, shows I can I I am at this level. Um, we also provide a variety of resources. Right now, these are heavily based on what people experience or obtain during the academy. And then notes um, that we can make either as designers of the matrix or as users who are filling it out. Now, what's nice is, as I mentioned, people can self-evaluate and then determine where do I need to either refresh myself or do some extra learning. And this helps make sure the teams actually have a common foundation when they come together to do improvement activities. One of the primary areas that are at work um, during any improvement activity is the theory of knowledge. It's foundational for improvement work. Without it, we wouldn't be successful in developing the tests and learning required to produce changes that are aimed at improvement. Dr. Deming provided us with this description of the theory of knowledge. He said it's knowledge is built on theory and theory of knowledge teaches us that a statement, if it conveys knowledge, predicts future outcomes with the risk of being wrong, 
and that it fits without failure observations of the past. As such, this definition provides an approach to learning that lives within the PDSA cycle, the plan, do, study, act cycle that Deming taught, and enables learning and thus improvement. Uh, Dr. Deming often said there's no substitute for knowledge. However, we're bombarded by substitutes daily. Many of these are tempting to interpret as containing knowledge. All of these sources may be interesting to us, may have lots of information, lots of data, um, and these are all examples of things that people use as substitutes for knowledge, but do not fit the definition that Dr. Deming provided to us. As we've worked in our coaching relationships with our team leaders and teams, we've noticed these things. The definition of the theory of knowledge leads us to focusing on making predictions that could be tested. Uh, we learned that betting on our predictions increased interest in both making predictions and in running tests to observe outcomes. And we'll touch on that just a little bit later. Managers make decisions which are essentially predictions. If you think about it, every single one of our decisions to do something, to use a resource, to purchase something, to uh, offer a product, uh, those are all decisions which really have a prediction at heart, at the heart. Dr. Demick frequently quoted Michael Twitty as saying, management is prediction. It's useful for us to evaluate our decisions in the same way as testing predictions is useful. And there's a wonderful example of theory of knowledge in action. Uh, pick up the book Principles, if you haven't done it already, by Ray Dalio. It's, uh, uh, a, it's an education in how to develop knowledge by testing your theories rigorously on an ongoing basis. So when we build a foundation, we, we talk, we're talking about the foundation for improvement. We discussed three basic questions earlier. It's useful to recall that they provide an ability to actually run PDSA cycles that produce improvement. So an example of a series of answers, questions and answers that showed up in our work our coach was asking our team leader, well, what are we trying to accomplish? Meaning, what is the team leader trying to accomplish with his team? The response was implement a disciplined approach to process improvement using PDSA methodology and documentation. Well, how will we know a change is improvement? There will be a documented, there will be documented PDSA cycles for each improvement and documented learning. And what moves can we make that will result in improvement? Start using the PDSA form routinely with our teams to document each improvement and our predictions and learning. What's interesting about the three basic questions, it's useful to revisit them anytime there's a change in leadership or team membership. Oftentimes, anytime you're designing anything, be it a meeting, an improvement project, a strategy, the three basic questions are good fundamental approaches to producing improvement. Now, PDSA is essentially a theory of knowledge in action. And to provide some consistency to how our team leaders are applying the PDSA cycle, we use a simple form. The first part of it is, what's our plan? Um, we will move the following, and we want people to be as specific as possible about their plan. The essence of what we're talking about here is, is the concept of move to improve. If, if anything is going to improve, something has to be moved, whether it be a physical object, a piece of equipment, a wall, um, a utility access point, those kind of things. Or it could be something digital. We might move a field on a screen. We might move a step in a process. Uh, there's a variety of things that we look at that allow us to produce improvement only through moving something first. And then we say, well, what will you predict will be the results? What will you see? 
And essentially, predictions are only valid when documented before a test. It's pretty easy to say, I, oh, I knew that in hindsight. However, documenting it beforehand solidifies what you were thinking before the test was run, gets away from some of the ways our brain works to combine all the all areas of knowledge into, well, we knew that all along. Now, one of the other things that's important when we make a prediction is that they be specific and testable. So we've run into several words that we turn into a banned prediction uh, words list. And essentially what we're saying is um, any, any of these words make it very difficult to test a prediction. We want it to be specific. We want numbers, narrow ranges, times, distances, whatever it is that makes it easy to evaluate and learn from, to know, yes, we were right or no, we were wrong in our prediction. And thus, we can learn from that. Now, the, this, the test, so I'm going to describe a test and some theories that, that went on. Um, there is one of the things the team said is we think operators always know what the problems are. So this was a team that was looking at um, defects and issues on, in their uh, uh, factory floor, I'll call it. And what they predicted was, or at least half the team predicted this, ideas from operators will align with the data developed for a concentration diagram the improvement team had created. They call it a heat map. Where's the hot spots on the, in the process? Half the team said operators will be able to produce ideas that align with the map. Half the team said, no, I don't think so. Now, they, they compared the data basically with here's the heat map, and then here's where the operators say we need to focus our attention. What they learned was there was no correlation between operator ideas and the collected data. So they were challenged with we had a theory, or at least half the team had a theory, that wasn't accurate. Now they were forced to review their theory and say, well, why wasn't that working? What they concluded was, well, the operators had not been receiving the same feedback and data that the quality team had. And thus, we shouldn't expect them to be producing ideas and recommendations that we think they should be producing. So. This is a little more detail about that. So they went on to revise their theory based on this simple test. Now, as we deal with team leaders, they basically have two learning and improvement paths. One is in their team leader role and their own personal, their capabilities for having the team operate and perform improvement work successfully together. And the other is in the team's capabilities as a team. How are we doing functioning as a team rather than as a collection of individuals? And so as we spent time coaching the team leader, we spent time at working with them to, on both cycles. One-on-one -on -one for the team leader role and then also one-on-one -on -one with the team capabilities, but those, he was, they were working um, through the team and generating work that way. A valuable concept for all of us is appreciation for a system. Dr. Deming defined a system as a network of inter interdependent components that work together to try to accomplish the aim of the system. And he drew this diagram for us, production viewed as a system. There's some things, I think many of you have seen this, there's some things that are nice and unique about this view, view of an organization that don't show up on an org chart. We see consumers and suppliers integrated and part of the system. We see design and redesign, therefore improvement is built into the cycle of work we do, as is innovation, generation of ideas. And then if you follow the flow of this work, it's essentially a PDSA at the organization level. So ongoing improvement can occur at the organization level because the design and understanding of the system enables plan, do, study, act cycles to be conducted by leadership. 
Deming went on to say, improvement of quality envelops the entire production line from incoming materials to the consumer and redesign the product and service for the future. So this expands the playing field for any improvement team. They must operate far beyond the confines of the quality department or whatever their home department happens to be. This is from a conversation between Russell Acoff and Dr. Deming. The performance of the whole is never the sum of the performance of the parts taken separately. It is the product of their interactions. And we believe we should make, oftentimes, this is how we operate. We believe we should make each individual part of the organization or person the best it can be or they can be and hope it can work with the other parts. The problem we find is that performance of any component does not simply add to the performances of all the rest to produce a result. Our organizations are full of interdependent interactions. Fit is critical, and thus, so is focusing on the interactions on our teams and our organization. How we connect is critical, more so than how we function within our own department. So as, as improvement team leaders and participants, we must focus on the interactions rather than the parts and behavior taken separately. We see this on the shop floor, where we look at the multiple flows of a production system that make the production system function well. From finished goods flow all the way through to you know, engineering and QA at the source flows. We have to make sure that the interactions are working, that the flows of product and information are coordinated and work together to produce value for our customers. Another principle that we notice is very important is every system has an aim or purpose that serves as a primary organizing principle for the parts. And when we look at many teams, they frequently are not completely aligned on what their aim is. Same with our organizations. Dr. Deming has said, without an aim, there is no system. Now, in our work environment, we frequently see percentages like this, incidental work, non-value-added work, and value-added work. Value-added work consisting of a very minimal part of the activity that's going on. In the office, the office not only has traditional shop floor waste, but also experiences business process waste. So Kevin Dugan from the Institute for Operational Excellence has listed the business process ways that are very useful to understand. The top two he's identified as scatter and handoffs. Scatter being constant reprioritization, meaning stop this, start that, go back to the first thing, now drop that for a third thing. It's a huge waste generator. And then, find, and then handoffs, we all know of the problem of handoffs, either just the delays that occur or the incomplete information that goes from one person to the next. Explanations required, delays that are occurring. Um, one example we ran into was between the day and evening shifts, afternoon shifts, there was no overlap. And so it was very uh, challenging to ensure that work was coordinated between the shifts. Now, in, in the terms of uh, Deming's definition of a system, uh, it requires an aim. If the aim is constantly changing, we're essentially working in an environment where there is no there is system. And then we look at the definition of handoffs. We need to pay attention to our interactions and ensure that there's actually uh, coordinated successful handoffs if they're necessary or eliminate those completely. Another perspective we took as we looked at the system was a spaghetti chart. Now this is a, a, a mock-up. Uh, we aren't showing the, the, the exact one that was used, but the team mapped uh, travel of people and parts in their department. Um, they identified as a result of that, the need to duplicate equipment in certain areas to reduce the amount of excess time as people were going 
back and forth between areas, putting on appropriate clothing for one space and another. They had to improve access to utilities in some areas because it was wasting time as they, people went around walls and through doors to get things that they were required to do their work. And it prevented repeated time-consuming enter and leave routines. Um, and this was uh, probably somewhat known that things take a long time, but until they actually mapped it out and identified the issues on a spaghetti chart or um, this map, um, it, it, they didn't have clear evidence of this is the issue and these are the places we need to fix these issues. And they ended up eventually running PDSA cycles that implemented kitting to make changeovers more effective. They revised their shift maintenance schedules and they also developed a plan B procedure for busy days because one of their productions was oh, this procedure will work until we get busy. Well, once they said that, they said, well, now we need a procedure for when we get busy. And they, they implemented a plan B. And as a tangent here, a useful response to most questions that we get is, let's go see. So if someone has an issue about something that's happening, the first thing to respond is, well, let's go take a look. Another principle is, in in a complex organizational system are often remote from causes, making it very difficult to recognize structure and learn from experience. Another way of saying that is cause and effect are distant in time and space. This showed up on this site when site leadership required process speeds to increase. They thought we need more throughput and therefore we're gonna increase our processing speeds and requirements. However, they did it without testing or without practice. So we ended up with less time to deal with non-mistake-proofed areas, reduced time to think about the work. We started relying on operator memory. And as a result, there were increased errors. And then a team was formed to reduce the outstanding errors without the realization that if we backtracked through the chain, the site leadership was the source of the outstanding errors. Another principle that's worth paying attention to is things get worse before they get better. During the academy, we run a short experiment that basically cuts our work from day one to day two. The day two difference is the work is exactly the same as in day one, only we do half the steps. However, the half the steps are not sequential. They're every other step. And there's a learning curve involved. However, and eventually the process does speed up. But what we notice is not only does the process speed up, but when we do this experiment repeatedly, there are predictable occurrences of regression while improvement is taking hold. We can count on that as we work with our improvement teams as they implement improvement processes, improve processes that it is always is not always a smooth path from improvement to better. So one of the things we want to look at is making sure we have in our mind an expectation that things will there'll be hiccups along the way. And then oftentimes people want to abandon a change before the new process is stable and has shown its capability. They expect improvement immediately to take hold, and that's almost never the case. And as we do work with coaches and teams and team leaders, what we found in our process was we, we worked with short, frequent communication. By that, I mean daily 6.30 a.m., 10-minute phone calls during weekdays. We had a communication between the coach and the coach who's coaching the team leader. It eliminates batching. It makes it possible for issues to be addressed in short segments. Um, thinking uh, in 10 minutes and discuss, 10 minute discussions narrows the focus to the agenda that we have on hand. Now, our agenda for those conversations are basically, what did I promise to do yesterday? What did I actually accomplish? Without the story, just the what so. No explanation, no excuses. It's just I did this or I didn't do that. And if it wasn't accomplished, we want to look at, well, what structures need to alter or we're missing 
that had me not do what I committed to doing? And then what am I promising to do today? And then on no call days, we did a phone check in with the coachee leaving that same, those same agenda items on a voicemail. As we went through our work, we ran into several issues. I'm going to discuss a few of them here. One of the most problematic is change of leadership. It's, it's like scatter, reprioritization of what we're supposed to be doing. Now, on the team leader, we actually had a team leader changeover fairly early in our, our work. And we went from working with one team leader, getting her up to speed, um, and starting to get on pace. And then um, she left, and we needed to integrate a new team leader into the same team. We also ran into an issue where we had a managerial leader leave. Um, that caused significant issues. Um, they wanted to, uh, she wanted to keep a message from her previous company uh, as the working approach, disregarding what had been learned in her new organization with our teams. And one of the quotes from our people was, her leadership did a number on our team leader. It was very challenging for them to do work under this new person. And it, it had to do with an understanding of variation. This new team leader did not understand variation, was not able to distinguish common from special cause variation, and responded to almost everything um, in their environment in relation to specification limits and not spec limits. So what we noticed was the majority of issues being tracked and investigated on a control chart were shown to be common cause. A previous team had actually updated standard work to check first what's the source of variation and investigate only special cause errors because those are things we needed to understand or ask what happened and get a valuable response. The new manager, without an understanding of variation, required a return to the use of spec limits and the number of investigations and backlogs increased tremendously. The current issue is we can't think of a single instance where action is driven by control limits. It's all spec limits. So we're basically in this situation here where the system is operating in a different realm than the specification limits are looking for. And because we're chasing special causes, we're not addressing the common cause issues that have all the results be um, well, basically, the results are not. The, it's a un, it, the system is not capable of producing the results we're looking for. We need a different approach than chasing special causes. Now, the other thing we ran into is that the specification limits used by individuals looking at the process are different. There are no operational definitions. The specifications change with each person answering the question, is this a defect? Essentially, if we were following Dr. Deming's definition from out of the crisis, we would have a test, a criterion, and a yes or no decision that would allow us to be confident that each of us looking at the same thing would declare it the same defect or not. We should not have answers that are dependent on a single person's interpretation of the definition. Essentially, what we're seeing is the animal cracker exercise in real life. It's an exercise we run in the academy. We find that definitions of what's a, a defective animal cracker produces multiple different responses when different people are reading those definitions. And we see that occurrence or examples show up in our work world all the time. So operational definitions have become a critical thing for us to pay attention to. Also dealing with a new team leader, one of the things that we, we are looking at are um, how the team leader operates. Frequently, when we're moving from an individual performer to a team leader, they want to go it alone. They do the work. They turn into individual performer mode. They also tend to not have trust in the team. They think they can do it better than anybody else in the team. It's the 90-30 rule in action. The 90-30 rule says 90% of the population believes they're in the top 30% of the population. 
So if we have team leaders operating with that rule, and we all do, um, they're going to have some version of mistrust for the rest of the team. And also, they're not, if they're not an academy graduate, they haven't been trained in the basic improvement concepts and methods. And then they might begin to lose sight of one of the two learning cycles they're responsible for. Typically, it's the leading cycle that they tend to neglect. So in supporting a new team leader, asking these kind of questions are helpful. What's important to you? What is meaningful work? What does taking on the leader role versus individual performer role look like to you? How do you want to be supported? What do you want to get out of our relationship? And how do you see this working? Now, all improvement requires learning. Dr. Deming is famous for saying, I make no apologies for learning. When people were frustrated with him continuing to update uh, the things he had been teaching. Now, new knowledge is a prerequisite for improvement. And that new knowledge has to be about the people, the work, the product, the processes, or the interactions throughout our systems. It's not an easy task. And individual learners may not produce team learning. So what we want to look for is what are the activities we can participate in that begin to generate team learning such that we now have a skill as a team. Any team activity requires team practice. We don't learn it in isolation. Now, improvement work is frequently viewed as extra, not part of the job. Intentional practice is required to integrate the three basic questions and PDSA into all work. Frequently, teams fail to make predictions or fail to write them down. This limits their ability to learn. They don't document their PDSA cycle. This prevents team learning because they're not clear on what they were testing, what their theory was behind the test, and then the results of their study leading to the next set of actions they're going to take. Or they don't devote sufficient time to study. So study and revised theory disappears, and frequently they begin to stop making predictions based on their theory or even paying attention to the fact that they have a theory that their tests are, are uh, evaluating. And they frequently debate approaches. So rather than debating, the simple approach should be, how could we test that and run a few PDSA cycles to examine our opinions? And then sooner or later, there's people that question the team process. One of the best ways to get around this is put them in charge of a PDSA test, have them design the learning, their own learning, and then the why are we doing this begins to, to fade away. Other team learning, issue, learning issues include aims are seldom aligned without intentional effort. Betting on various team member predictions adds a level of thought not present when simply stating probable outcomes. We had one test where we said, let's pass out $100 in monopoly money, not real money, to everybody on the team and say, how much would you bet on this prediction? And what showed up was people spent more time contemplating what's the value that I would place on that prediction. And then leaders, what we noticed, were seldom observing the work of improvement teams. They would hear about them, they would see a few changes being made, but they were never quite in the room. Now we had an opportunity where we did a three-level meeting where the team was initially misaligned and confused about what they were doing. We did a short exercise that produced alignment on what their aim is, who owns it, and what our work is. And then we did the experiment with betting on the outcome. It so happened that day one of our observers was the vice president of manufacturing and he ended up saying this is exactly what I want other teams in our company to be doing regarding the database approach we're using. 
So it was very, it was very positive outcome having a senior leader come in and observe the team at work. There are useful t questions for to support team learning issues. How could we test that? What is a test we can run and learn from today or this afternoon? How was common versus special cause determined? What have you witnessed? What's missing that if added could make a difference? What's present that if, if removed would make a difference? And what can we move? And then another key issue that we run into is the naysayer. Now, we should realize the naysayer is the work and the way. We will always have naysayers. We should embrace the opportunity. First, it's very important, and this goes back to a Cully principle, seek first to understand. Go above and beyond what you think is necessary for understanding what the naysayer is concerned about. Because frequently, they really do have a legitimate concern, and their approach to describing or voicing their concern is not always positive, but it may be valuable for us to understand it. And we should address the three basic questions from the naysayer's point of view. What are you trying to accomplish? How do you know a change would be an improvement? And then what can we move to produce that? So how could we test that? And then finally, frequently, and we've done this, make the naysayer a PDSA leader. Um, they become a vocal proponent of the work um, once they lead and find uh, learning occurs through this process. So I'm going to turn this back over to Frank for facilitating questions in our remaining time. Thank you, Eric. Frank, you're, um, you're unmuted. Thank you, and uh, I know Hank has been monitoring the questions. You want to uh, take a few to uh, discuss over the time period that we have remaining? Um, sure, sure. Um, as some of them that kind of um, kind of a theme around it, Eric, is and and probably a little more depth. Kind of when you did the prediction piece, you have different, basically the, the gist is you have different pe different team members with different predictions. Um, like with the mo monopoly um, example, but how do you, what else have you seen in terms of um, gaining consensus from the team on what their experiments should be? Well, sometimes the, it goes back to the, the first of the three basic questions. What are we trying to accomplish? So if, if um, one of the basic questions is, we want to reduce the number of defects that this area produces, um, how do we know that? Um, we, we evaluate a measure, either a count or a period of time, those kind of things. And then we come up with, oh, well, we think defects are produced by uh, something missing on the form. And we can we can evaluate uh, a, a new field or a change that way. Now, if people want to debate that, we go back to the question of well, let's let's test this rather than argue right or wrong. So mostly we spend time making an effort to test ideas and and validate or uh, invalidate uh, theories that we have. Um, it it it. It's important to have an environment where it's okay um, to make a prediction and be wrong. You know, we had a leader one time that said, well, not every suggestion I make is a good one after one was, you know, a couple were shown as to be invalid. Um, that's the way we learn. So it's, it's important to have an environment where you can actually say, well, I have a different perspective, but let's test yours and then we can test mine as well and we can learn from both. Well, good. Um had several questions basically going around the theme of, uh, do you have um, examples? Do you have an approach? Do you have some details on how to convert a, a naysayer into basically a cheerleader? Um, there, there's been a couple. Um, one was very interesting, um, not from this specific project, but from a, a past experience. I had uh, a veteran 
from the accounting department uh, that said, I'm not interested in this uh, improvement activity. I don't think it's uh, worthwhile. And I'm retiring soon anyway, so I don't need to participate. And I said, well, when are you retiring? He says, I retire in five years. And so I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective on, on time. And then uh, we asked him, uh, because it was actually an a organizational requirement at that time that everybody in the, in the company be a participant in both a value stream mapping event and a, um, a Kaizen or lean improvement event. We asked him to participate in a lean improvement event in the machine shop. And we had a fairly big machine shop. And he was able to make differences in um, uh, TPM, uh, product, total productive maintenance issues. He was able to clean, do signage, uh, collect data. Um, we moved some things around. We actually saw an impact in the week that we were in the shop uh, on the performance of that area. And at the end of it, uh, this person came to me and said, you know, I've never seen uh, that kind of work done before. I would like to be the champion in the accounting department for this improvement project. So he went from saying, I don't need to do this to I want to lead it. Eric, we had um, a question asking about the contrast between your methodology and the Toyota Kata method. They're very similar. Um, one of the things that's probably the most distinctive is the, the effort to um, clarify, state, and document the theory and predictions uh, before a test, and then to actually study and evaluate the, the results in light of the theory we were using and the predictions we made versus checking um, that has us just say, how'd it go? And so um, some practitioners of Kata have, have realized we need to spend more time on the theory part and the prediction part. Um, so depending on who's applying Kata, you may just get a PDCA approach where you just check the results and go on to the next or um, you might get more of a blend of PDSA, which is study using theory as a foundation for your improvement actions. So we're, we're not all that far apart. Um, it, a lot of it, I've noticed, depends on the practitioner. Good. Um, had a note for asking, oh, sorry, asking about um, sometimes it, it's in a team environment, it's a challenge to get everybody actively engaged to be able to share their ideas. Everybody has a little different, unique personality. Um, is there a way that you began to maybe tailor uh, your approach to understand the individuality of people and incorporate those into um, a well-functioning activity and engaged team? Well, it's interesting. See, so it, it, it points to the issue of everybody's unique and different, and we all have different ways of, of uh, wanting to communicate. And we all have, we come to the team with different levels of uh, comfort with uh, sharing our ideas. And some of that comes from the environment we're in. Um, it's either safe or not safe to, to, um, to present ideas or to, to challenge other people's ideas. So one of the things that's useful is, first of all, having conversations um, and and interactions that that um, we we say um, we are here to learn. We're not here to be right. Um, we're also um, in, interested in uh, focusing on well, what's the purpose we're here for, and how do we make a contribution to that. We can ask people, what do you think you want to do to contribute to this? It's a lot easier than assigning people roles. And we can also pay attention to, are we getting input from everybody on the team as we have conversations? It's, it's real easy to let those who want to speak first um, 
or who have a slightly higher role in the organization organizationally to lead conversations, but the team leader needs to be responsible for making sure that we uh, pull people in and ask opinions. Um, what do you think about that? Um, is there some other way that you're thinking of this? Um, um, and then uh, asking people if they will take the lead on certain roles. Um, I've seen people who are fairly junior in, in, in the organization be asked to be a team leader on a particular uh, PSA cycle or Kaizen event and, and show leadership um, capabilities that weren't there, uh, weren't recognized before. And so oftentimes the opportunity to, to be a leader requires um, being a leader and, and demonstrating that you can actually do those things um, that are uh, required to contribute to the team. So there's lots of different ways to involve people. Um, I think it's important to make sure that um, we're paying attention to are we involving people and making requests in ways that um, support what they want to accomplish. Good. Um, you talked a little bit on spec limits and you showed the um, basically the control limits. And a question, is the right approach to start a variation reduction problem to start with control charts and do a deep dive on why there are out of control points? Well, Dr. Deming said if I had to um, leave people with one message, it'd be redu reduce variation, right? So one of the things we look for is, uh, first of all, can we observe the variation in our process? It takes a little bit to get the right measures going. Now, if we have um, data that can tell us how our process is functioning and, and uh, do we have common or special cause variation, uh, the first thing we'd like to do is, is start to um, produce a common cause system out of that. So that would require having some understanding of what the special causes are and then addressing those special causes. And then we work to, once we have predictable results from our system, the idea is to then reduce the variation or um, shift the mean in the direction we want it to go. So yeah, the idea is, you know, like variation reduction is a very powerful approach and there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, it depends on the process and the, and the work you're doing. Good, Eric. I think we have time for about two more questions. One was um, asking you to repeat what the 90-30 principle meant. Oh, yeah. 90% of the people think they're in the top 30% of the population. Now, I, I first heard that from Mary Jenkins back back in the, I'm going to say way, way long ago, um, before Dr. Deming passed away. Now, there's, um, there's other people who have come up with very similar theories and approaches, but I haven't been able to see anybody that's uh, got a documented, published uh, theory uh, before I heard it from Mary Jenkins. But I don't know where Mary got it from. Mary was the the leader of human resources at General Motors Powertrain, which is basically the test bed for Dr. Deming's ideas when he was working with General Motors. And then um, Mary's published some very good work on um, performance appraisals. So she, when she came to EDS and had a conversation with us, she talked about that. I remember it, it struck me as one of those most interesting kind of things. I said, I'd never heard of that. And yet it applies. You can hear it. Um, some people call it the IKEA effect. Um, there's other things, challenges that, I mean, other, other research that supports that concept. The percentages might not be the same, but it, it's, a, it's a well understood psychological concept. We think we're better than we are in comparison to other people. Well, good. And then, Eric, our last question is going back and asking if you could state just briefly at a high level the difference between Six Sigma and then the ACE program. Um, that's not at all a topic of what we were talking about here, so I, I don't know that I want to take that on. Well, good. Well, we will just end, end here out there. Frank, I'm unmuting you. I'll let you just answer that privately, and then um, Frank, turning it over to you. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I, I'm sure we didn't get 
to answer every question at this point, but uh, we will be collecting the questions and Eric has agreed to answer all the questions and that that um, summary of the answers will go out to all the participants um, in a few days. Also, um, in a few days, you should be receiving an email, as I indicated at the, at the outset, that has an embedded link to a certificate of participation. Um, so if you don't receive that, again, check your junk mail. It may be there. I want to thank Eric for taking the time to share with us some very important, interesting information about his MVP. Now, just for clarity, MVP does not mean most valuable player, okay? It, is, it means minimum viable product. It's a concept that Eric Reese introduced with his uh, Lean Startup. So if you're interested in that, this is some work on causing improvement through others that Eric and I, Heidi have been doing um, as part of a larger PDSA cycle for coaching coaches. So as I said earlier, this presentation is now recorded and it will be posted on the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division YouTube channel later this week. So I want to remind you that on November 13th, we'll have another of our Lean Enterprise Division webinars at 1.30 uh, Eastern, 12.30 Central, and 10.30 Pacific time. And um, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, have a great day.